These books return to the library on the same Google trucks after their scanning, but, they, but that journey had placed them on a different footing within the library. They had become a kind of some symbiotic competitors with their own surrogates. And I have some slides showing library card catalogs where if you search for a particular book, say at the UVA library, you give three choices for access. One is the Google Books version, two is the Hathi Trust version, and three is the version of the stacks. Well, guess what 99.9% .9 of people do? They click on the full text version. What they get is the Stanford copy or the Harvard copy, not the UVA copy, which actually has interesting descriptions that you know, we can talk about. So my recent work has been shaped um, by a growing sense of urgency regard regarding the future of the print record in the long 19th, of the long 19th century in the wake of this wide-scale digitization, um, of which I've been a practitioner on the DH side, but that's another story. Uh, so the primary custodians of this material, that is academic libraries, have begun to question the value of retaining extensive collections of little used print that they regard as duplicative of other copies and plans to manage down the size of libraries are well underway. As I said, the 19th century is particularly vulnerable here. Most books were printed before 1800 are already in special collections or rare book rooms. They're valuable because they were hand-pressed period books. And most books printed after 1923 are still in copyright and therefore can't be served freely online. In addition, many 19th century books are in bad shape uh, due not only to the cheaper materials used in their making as industrial products, but because they've been left in the circulating collections of libraries that just sort of been battered around. Um, this is particularly true of books printed after 1860 when wood pulp paper, now often tan and brittle with acid, uh, came into general use in the trade. So the result is a fragile, neglected set of materials, not particularly rare if you measure, measure them by value in the open market, mostly unused by library patrons, and increasingly represented in full text online via surrogates created by Google and others. In other words, to some, the case looks dangerously close to close. Yet the vulnerability of the 19th century print record is matched by, in some ways bound up with, its particular value to our cultural moment. Our neglect of this material suggests our need for its lessons regarding the intertwined force of its content and physical forms um, in creating meaning and in constituting modern textual media. The great age of industrial printing produced the reading habits and academic institutions in which we now operate. Moreover, it reflected and elaborated the cultural traditions of Romanticism that continue to shape our understanding of time and memory and books and of the humanities in general. So I worry that we're winnowing this historical record in all of its multi-form granularity at precisely the moment that we're most in need of its lessons. And so I'd like to show you some efforts I'm leading to get scholars and students involved um, in, in the conversation about the future of print library collections. That is, uh, faculty and students often don't pay much attention, pay enough attention to the library and are involved in meaningful ways in what the library is up to and I'm working to kind of build bridges uh, across those two uh, parts of the institution. Um, but first, I, before I I'll talk about book traces itself, I want to say a bit more about the ways that books in the 19th century were bound up with the lives of their readers and about our own encounters with the materials that those hands not quite left behind. Um, I'm just going to check to see if I have any pictures to show you yet. I do not. So we're going to have to just go, go naked on this one. Um, well, I can't talk about that example because it's visual. Um, but uh, uh, let me skip that. Um, so the, 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 the project began uh, in a class of mine of students who I sent into the stacks just to bring back copies of 19th century books of poems to see what books looked like back then. We were working for a modern Norman anthology, and I realized that to understand what poetry was doing, you kind of had to see it in its original dress. And what came back? Whereas uh, this collection of books by uh, the poet Felicia Hemmons who we were working on that day, one of which um, had a name in the front of the cover. Uh, Ellen Pierpont, 1846, uh, in the poetic works of Mrs. Felicia Hemmons, published in Philadelphia by Grig and Elliot. Um, and we did a little research on this person, and we figured out who she was. She was 18 years old at that time, the youngest child of Hezekiah and Anna Constable Pierpont, part of the wealthy and influential family that essentially built modern Brooklyn. And her book is in the open stacks here at the University of Virginia. It was donated by her granddaughter 100 years later. And it has various annotations made in pencil, which I can say more about, the check marks and patterns of underlining that she does. She sort of likes things, engages them, highlights them uh, with her pencil. But the thing that struck us most is this inscription on the free end paper, written in pencil in Ellen's handwriting, the same hand as the, as the name at the front. Sing mournfully, sing mournfully, our dearly loved is gone. The gifted and the beautiful is from our sight withdrawn. 
then let us sing her requiem now in this, our parting hour, and softly breathe her name, who was our fairest, loveliest flower, Mary, Mary, Mary. And a little genealogical re resource, research revealed that this was her daughter, Mary Montague Minor, who died at the age of seven of diphtheria um, in 1862. So that 16 years after she first acquired the book, Ellen Pierpont, 1846, she had become Mrs. Minor, and she wrote this elegy for her third daughter in this kind of halting and moving pastiche of Hemmings' own style. The poem sounds like one of Hemmings' poems, but it's not its original composition. She has transformed her copy of Hemmings into a memorial site and also into a kind of collaborative anthology. Like a family Bible, the book bears witness to stages and losses across many years, and like a source book of feeling, it seems to have offered an idiom to its owner having lost her child, as Amy Hempel puts it, fluent now in the language of grief. So we, we realized that this, we were at the edge of something here, that this was a practice that we hadn't paid any attention to. I had meant the students to look at the books as physical productions, not as evidentiary scenes. I mean, we were bibliography, not reading history, but we, we embarked on this. We found another copy of Hemmings in our same collection, inscribed to Charlotte M. Cock from a friend in 1840, and only has one page in marked on the graves of the household, which is this poem about people in the family dying of, away from the home. And, and there's check marks and underlinings all over this poem, including the stanza that reads, one midst the forest of the west by a dark stream is laid, the Indian knows his place of rest far in the cedar shade. And next to those lines, Charlotte, now Mrs. Gordon, she, we got the book when she was a young girl and much later wrote in it as a, as a mother. My darling William died December 29th, 1879. Um, she received her copy when she was young and unmarried. She turned over much later to mourn the death of a child. Her son, William Fitzhugh Gordon, died in Texas at the age of 28 by the dark streams of the West, according to Hemmings' language, exactly 39 Christmases after Charlotte first received the book as a gift. Um, so in both copies, in one library collection, Hemmings' poetry had become a touchstone for personal grief, and the books themselves took on this quasi-memorial character marked and revisited across the years. And the two copies of one library collection should have the same kind of response, suggested that this was a much larger phenomenon and pattern. Um, and so we began then by looking more closely, volume by vo vo volume, by volume, at all the pre-1923 books in our circulating stacks. Um, and we found that our local holdings are particularly rich in evidence of use, and we began to wonder how far the state of affairs holds true in the circulating library collections of other libraries. Um, and you can sort of see behind me um, what came out of this booktraces.org, which was an attempt to crowdsource at a national level examples of this. So if you see a copy in your library, it was the idea, take a picture with your smartphone, upload it, and give me an example of the annotation or the marking that you've discovered. We've had about 600 uploaded so far. And um, so it's, uh, we see clearly now that this is not just local to UVA, but something that, that's happened, that happened generally the way library collections were built. Basically, um, it was before the Second World War, most college and university libraries acquired their collections via donations. There were no budgets to buy library books for most libraries before the GI Bill, and enrollments really increased. So how did you fill the stacks? You reached out to the local families. 1930, 1940, Victorian grandmothers are all dying off. Large collections of books are there. What do we do with grandma's books? We give them to the institution that her son went to, or that her son went to, or whatever. And that's what happened. So that accident of library history means that the shelves of our libraries are filled with books that were in personal collections and sort of acquired this evidence of use in uh, daily, life, daily life of the everyday readers of the 19th century. Now again, I say everyday readers. I was talking about this a little earlier. We're obviously getting a skewed sample because it's only the wealthy and influential families probably that donated large collections of books to libraries, right? So we're actually getting upper middle class white families, um, usually influential families of the area, associated with the institution in one way or another that built these collections. Books were valuable enough to save and donate, but not so valuable that you couldn't write in them. Um, they're, they're kind of this weird status of the 19th century book where it wasn't so expensive that it was a precious thing, but it was precious enough to 39 years later, you still got your Hemmings on the shelf and you know where it is and you know what you want to write in it. And then when you die, your family thinks it's valuable enough to pass on and not just put out by the curb, which is what we often have to do with books now. Um, so, um, because of this accident of library history, we only get one shot at it. In other words, the reason these libraries are filled with these, this material is because of those cycles of generations and the way collections were built. They all came in around the same time and they're not coming in again. There are no more Victorian grandmothers. They're gone. 
and their, their books are already have been disposed of, and they're not coming back. Um, and and uh, so, you know, because of this accident, the circulating collections uh, have become the repositories of what I'm thinking now is the greatest extant material archive of the history of modern reading and practice and book use, hidden in plain sight, distributed across the circulating stacks of the country. And that's the Gamble Book Traces project, is that we can begin to investigate this and, and catalog this material and reconstitute at scale the ways books were used in different disciplines by different types of users, different types of interventions. Um, so, uh, another thing I'll say about that is that a lot of, um, what, what another interesting thing that comes out of it is the ways that what collections get reconstituted. As you begin to search, you realize that there's a, a, a finite number of donors who gave books to Millsaps or to UVA or wherever, and their collections begin to emerge. They're all distributed across the stacks because they just were put wherever the call number required it. When you begin to look, you find the same donors over and over again. Callaway, Gehrer, names we're looking at today in the stacks at Millsaps, and we'll see again this afternoon. UVA has the same thing. So you begin to see a readership, uh, read how found, uh, a certain family read, what kind of books they read, certain readers, how they marked, et cetera, et cetera. Once, once you distribute those books into the used book market, you'll never be able to reconstitute that because of, anyway, I have some great examples of this if I can ever show them, but I don't know if I can. Um, no, I don't think it's going to happen. You guys, sorry. And there are a few of the slides that I know you have under April 2014, you know, the, the slide with the dolls closed. Um, do I? Uh, through, through book traces oh. on the main site, like you go down to April 14, 2014 on the, yep. That's 16. Uh, we'll go all the way down oh. and you can scroll to 2014. How do you know this? Because uh, I just pulled it off my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, let's, let's, see, let's, let's see what's going on. Um, oh, well, that's a good one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Here, let me let me show you this one. This is a good one we found. Okay, so um, this is <laughs> yeah. I'll show you. A few. Well, okay. Yeah, let's go down. There's the dog gloves. Let's look at the dog gloves. Like that one. Antebellum fashions. This is a copy of Life of Napoleon Bonaparte. But you, you can see the little girl making. Uh, this is before the Civil War. Uh, what the clothes look like. Um, so that's just sitting in a circulating book. If someone checks that out, it's going to fall right under their backpack or whatever. A lot of this. this we're not just talking about marks. We're talking about inserts too. Um, Let's see, where are we here? So I'm not a PC user either, which is complicating this. Um, there's the Hammond's example. Ah, here we go. Michael, you are so helpful. Uh, there, there's Alan Pierpont, 1846. There's a library play, Charles Minor, is her youngest child. Uh, actually, those books were donated by his daughter. Um, and here's her little elegy for Mary, um, which I read to you earlier, which we found in that. Um, so let me give you this other example. Um, there's a sewing needle, that's a good one. Oh good, I have one of those poems about. Okay, good, we can kind of put this together. Okay, um, this example uh, I really like. This is um, a Dutch translation of Tennyson's poem, Ina Garden, uh, which no one ever reads anymore, but it's a, it's a really great narrative poem. Um, and uh, it's been translated into Dutch, here you go, 1869. Uh, and there's this note on the free end paper, which I think I can read even in that scale, because uh, I've read it a million times. Um, let's see. Uh, Oh wait, maybe I have, no, I don't have it written down. Uh, it's, it's posted from Rotterdam, August 28, 1889, something like that. Can I zoom in on this? No, I can't. Um, Dear Tom, while looking at a bookseller's window just now and uh, sort of laughing at Dombey and Zoom and other English works in Dutch, I, I uh, let's see, I saw this copy of Tennyson and uh, I retreated to a cafe and got a bottle of Rhine wine and I'm taking the two together. Um, and reading it now, it comes back to me that we read it together in Dear Richmond 19 years ago, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he's remembering reading Nina Garden in Richmond in 1865, right, 19 years earlier. They were both soldiers together in the Confederate Army right before the retreat, reading Nina Garden um, in this, you know, which had just come out in 65, it was brand new. Uh, they somehow had it with him. And they, he says, I can read this Dutch without the dictionary because I remember it so well. I remember, and I think I'm giving it to this copy now to show you how dear those days were to me and how much I think of you now, signed James R. Um, and he, he, throughout the book, he's written things like, you know, do you remember, do you remember reading this together, the mountain wooded to the brook, et cetera. So a clear memory of two soldiers reading in a garden together by the fires of Richmond as they retreated. And it's a poem about going home. Uh, it's, it's sort of an odyssey. And Enoch Arden is shipwrecked actually away from home for about 10 years and he comes back and his wife has married another man and had another child and he just sort of observes them and goes quietly away and dies without ruining their happiness. So it might have been a poem that struck a chord as they were getting ready to head home from the war, et cetera. So um, it's, a, 
that's a great example. Um, and let me give you one more while we're doing this. Wait, where's my April? Um, so, you know, as these stories started to come out, we realized that there's just so much to be done here, so many stories to be told, and each one requires a little bit of research. So I have a student actually now researching. This is Thomas Price, the, uh, is the, um, the uh, book owner here, and it was given to him by James R. I have a student who's figured out who James R. is, and she's got a whole thing, and she's doing a whole sort of paper on this relationship between these two men, and it's an amazing thing. But it's, it's one of those things you never would have paid any attention to until this book leapt out of the stacks and that their story came out together. Um, this one, um, this Longfellow Poems and Ballads, so let me bring up this, okay, great. So, this is, uh, uh, 1891 copy of Palm Longfellow's Poems and Ballads, and it has the following note written in pencil by its former owner, Jane Chapman Slaughter, on the front free end paper. And you're not looking at that now, but it says this in the front. Our readings together were in this book, ere you went to your life of work and sacrifice, and I remained to my life of infinite yearning for your presence, the sound of your voice, a yearning never to be satisfied in this world or the next. Now never I see thee, never more hear the voice of my comrade ever more dear, and he never came back. Um, and a number of the poems in the book bear her annotations with explicit reference to her memories of reading them, apparently with John H. Adamson, whose name is also inscribed in the front cover. Um, for example, in the bottom margin here uh, of this, after this poem, The Skeleton in Armor, Longfellow's ballad in which a ghostly Viking tells the story of winning the love of a blue-eyed maid. Uh, Jane has written this note. It's probably very legible. It's pretty legible there. Um, then you looked at your watch and said, now shall we go and make that visit? For at five o'clock I have to go to Washington. And we meant you and I, and we had a happy walk. Notice how she's underlining her own, she's annotating, she's underlining her own marginalia there in a way. But then, in a later hand, she's come back to this book much later um, and said on the facing page, our last walk together in this world, never to see each other more, never, oh never. It was after this I called you Norseman, the name we always use to the end in our letters. Do you remember? You added to it, you were Norseman, and you were devoted Norseman. Um, that is, in the Longfellow poem, the Viking warrior, the Norseman, inspires the maiden's love through storytelling. The poem says something like, once as I told in glee, tales of the stormy sea, soft eyes did gaze on me, burning yet tender. Lines that we can imagine formed an echo to what was happening with these Victorian lovers. As John read the lines aloud, James Marginalia tells us quite precisely, at 10 p.m. on Sunday, July 1st, 1900, in the parlor of the Alexandria Infirmary in Virginia, sitting in the great armchair. She's very explicit. This whole book is annotated with her memories of reading the particular poems, what he said, what she said, where they were. Um, so um, she notes in the margin to this poem, you read this and I said, it just suits your voice, stuff like that, her own commentary. Let me see if I have another picture of some of this. Um, oh, there's the, that's, that's, this is the front end paper that I just read. Sorry, I could have brought that up. Um, and then here, um, uh, at the close of the translation of Copas de Manrique, she writes, Sunday, May 6th, Nuble Pa, don't forget. Right? And then in her later hand, she's come back, read to me by my Norseman also long ago, before he went on his crusade in Liberia at Cape Town on the West Coast. Now, like, Cape Town isn't in Liberia, but I think that elderly Jane here is remembering Cape Mount Missionary Mission, which was in Liberia, and my guess is that John went off to the mission in, in Africa and didn't come back to it. Um, so, Precious as a shared object and source, this Longfellow book gets marked twice, first as a private message to an absent lover, and then some years later as an unsent letter to one who's been truly lost. That is, the first annotations made in 1900, just after his departure, were meant for him to see when he returned from his travels. The second ones are addressed more to his ghost, still asking, do you remember? Jane Slaughter never married. She was one of the first women to receive a PhD from the University of Virginia in Romance Languages, and her books were given to our library in the 1950s after she passed away. Um, so, like the other books I've surveyed here and told you about, her copy of Longfellow has come down to us as a nexus of human investments that is in part the business of the humanities to trace. And these examples show that similar and related uh, cases are out there in the circulating collections uh, nationwide. Um, so, as libraries think about what to keep, what to deduplicate, and what to uh, discard, my case is we need to think about what we mean by a duplicate, what we mean by a surrogate, what counts as a copy, and actually look at the individual artifacts before we think everything that has the same metadata, everything that has the same catalog entry is the same book. 
which say WorldCat encourages us to do, or our catalogs that send us either to the Harvard copy or the Stanford copy or whatever, they're all the same. It turns out they're not the same. Now we know this is the case for the hand press period. We would say, of course, different copies of Shakespeare's first folio. We don't just keep one and throw the rest away. They're all different because they were all made by hand and there's going to be all these interesting variations. We assume the industrial book, that is, particularly after 1830, with steam press and auto typesetting, all, all that stuff increases, but these books are regular. Um, but, and, and they are more regular at the point of production, although even that has been exaggerated, and we can talk more about that too. But certainly at the point of use, they've accreted all of this uh, uh, evidence of interaction, of um, it's almost like social media before the fact, you know, and books as social objects, and, and that's probably what we're trying to trace. Um, and as a scholar of 19th century literature, I have a particular vested interest here because, as I say, the 19th century strikes me as particularly vulnerable. Um, the, the, my case is that these books are more than copies, they're more than reports on the 19th century, they're individual scenes of evidence that have been produced, purchased, handled, marked, and saved by the culture that I'm trying to study. So one scanned copy of, of a book can tell us something, but vastly less than the array of actual volumes bearing the traces of individual production and reception. Um, and so how can we discover this? What should we do about this? Well, that's where book traces come in, and I've talked a little bit about this already. Um, this booktraces.org booktraces is an attempt, as I say, just to sort of crowdsource uh, this and let you can submit a book and upload examples. We also have a grant at UVA um, where we are methodically going through our, I'd say our entire collection, as much of our pre-1923 circulating material as we can, cataloging everything that we find. We're getting about a 13% hit rate, that is about 13% of the books overall have some kind of ownership mark in them that's significant, um, some more significant than others. Uh, and different polymer ranges have different, um, uh, different rates. So literature is much higher, uh, for example. Some up to 30%, some areas are down only to 5%. So what we'd like to do is actually have a rubric that we can give to other libraries and say, hey, if you have a large number of pre-23s in these five polymer ranges, why not look at those? Because you're probably going to get a large hit rate. We'd like to confirm that across libraries and figure out which books were most likely to attack, to attract what kind of annotation by what kind of annotator. It'd be nice to know whether how to men versus women say market books, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're at the very beginning of that project, um, but we uh, are hoping to reach out to other libraries, and that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Um, I have another great example that I can't talk about um, because this never happened. Um, so, uh, that's okay. Uh, we found a lot of great examples, and in fact, even to just today, um, we were, uh, Michael Pickard and I were looking in the stacks, and we found some uh, marked book. Within 30 minutes, we found some amazing copies, uh, including a book that was owned by a, what looks to be a former slave owner, uh, Watt, Scott Watkins, who lived in Sunnyside, I don't know where that is. But it's a book on the philosophy and justification for slavery in the United States, 1856 basically about why slavery is a good thing and God, God proves it. Uh, and it's underlined extensively with the arguments that this person agreed with. And so a great little research project for a student to figure out who was Watkins, what was Sunnyside, what was his, what was his relationship to slavery, how were these particular arguments that he chooses to underline and highlight related to what was happening in that period with abolition and with the conversation about slavery in the States. And again, we found that in five minutes just surfing through the stacks. There's a lot more out there. And so I'm hoping uh, to find more exam compelling examples like that, that stories can come out of, and, and students can be involved in original research with this sort of thing. It, it, it's got to be a crowdsourced effort because it's a lot. And every book needs that kind of illuminating historical research before it really begins to give up its secrets. That little elegy for Mary that we found that started the whole thing, if we had found it even five years ago, we would have left it be because we wouldn't have been able to Google Ellen Pierpont, minor, and do Ancestry.com and figure out her genealogy. So you see how the digital and the print are symbiotic. We actually need the digital to be able to do the kind of genealogical, historical research on the fly to make it make this history visible, and yet we still need the books because out of them will come these stories. Um, so the, uh, the markings that I've, I've discussed today suggest that readers cherish their books as these layered social and domestic objects. They found themselves and their own lost children and parents and partners within the precincts of these volumes, and in turn the books were transformed into deep, sometimes legible souvenirs through the strength of human love. Out of such essentially domestic circles, some of these books have come down to us as common property, bequeathed to universities and public institutions, and made available to readers and scholars. Our role as the interpreters of the resulting archive both demands preservation and depends upon access, and both of those terms are experiencing 
fundamental shifts under the influence of wide-scale digitization. In particular, individual copies are under a general downward pressure in our new information economy. What's the, what is the future of the 19th century book? It's up to all of us to decide. So I'm brought back finally then to Larkin, who calls the church a serious house on serious earth, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, and who concludes that we'll always need such places in ways that transcend their apparent utility. In the modern university, the book-filled library can never be obsolete. Even if the 21st century student seems uninterested in books, she learns from their variegated physical presence something about the passions and the triumphs, the farces and the tragedies consequent upon the pursuit of knowledge and the circulation of embodied forms. And with that, the books before her, and what Wallace Stevens might have called their holy hush of ancient sacrifice, she can begin her serious life. I think of those many 19th century books on the shelves and of their momently audible voices and imagine a student, perhaps initially bored and uninformed like Larkin, who nevertheless may find herself tending and attending to them, finding in them the marks of a reader who came before, and in seeing the interface of the book and its attendant passions with fresh eyes, becoming a patron at last. And as Larkin concludes his poem, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it to this ground, which he once heard was proper to grow wiser, if only that so many dead lie around. Thank you very much. So there's lots of examples up on booktraces.org you can explore at your leisure. I apologize for the uh, lack of slides for this, but you get the idea. Um, there is a kind of tactile, visual uh, quality to all this that's hard to convey in the talk, even in the images. Uh, and so part, part of the thing I'm struggling with is to what degree does an image help or hurt my cause. Um, I actually want the books to survive. I don't want them digi fully digitized. I want them to lead us back to the individual copies. And so I'll sort of preempt that. But um, this is actually a larger argument, not about bookmarking, but about the variety of individual copies generally. Um, and there are things in books we can't see because they have been visibilized to us. Uh, the, all this marking in books has been seen as damage for librarians for most of the time. And when I first brought this to UVA, they said to me, when I see writing in books, I write, I erase it, because it is damaged. Uh, and of course they would, because it's a circulating book, and students write in books, and they shouldn't do that. They weren't distinguishing between original owner marks and student marking. It took some education and some mutual conversations to convince, and now the libraries have been great, and we're all working on this together. But my larger argument is that books vary in ways that we don't see until a certain thing changes. We now care about marginalia. We didn't before. Um, and some of that will be point of production changes, some of that will be point of use uh, things, but the books are evidentiary scenes, and as we get rid of them, we lose the ability to make a historical inquiry about books and their readers. Marginalia is an easy one to talk about because it has these stories that come out. It's, it's very visible. A student can see it. It's 30 seconds in the stacks, whether it's there or not. But it's part of my larger brief for the retention of um, a um, what? bibliodiversity. Right? Uh, that we don't want a monoculture of books. We don't want a single copy. We don't want Harvard's copy uh, that was scanned by Google to stand in for an entire print run uh, because it's easily accessible. We want. We just believe in general that bibliodiversity, like biodiversity, will lead to more interesting things. It's better for a culture to support more of that than less. And so this is partly an argument on behalf of just um, cross-examination of multiple individual copies and treating what each one as an individual artifact of a past that we're interested in trying to study. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, in a little bit, we're going to go into the stacks and see what we can find. Um, I'd like to hear about how uh, how this has tripled outward. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about the notion of going to the stacks and, and finding books and there's this part of me that gets up by This is like cooler than the Pokemon Go. Um, <laughs> it's like, it is a bit like that, yeah. Um, but, uh, and so that's just leading me to wonder, you know, how many, how many uh, submissions have you bought from other institutions, from other um, geographic yeah. Yeah, I'm putting, I've just put up here the events list. This is kind of a historical record of places that I've given talks or had events like the one we're doing today. Um, so, you know, you can see the range of places, everything from Lehigh and Millsaps and, to um, Harvard and, uh, and Columbia and um, Georgia, going to South Carolina in a couple weeks. 
And so I'm trying to basically be on the road and sponsor these things and get librarians interested, get faculty interested, seed events in other places. There have been other ones that have happened where I wasn't there, so I think Arizona State's doing one next week where they just email me and say, hey, I'm a bunch of students. And I also see things come up, like Hope College just did a bunch of stuff. They never got in touch with me, but I just saw a bunch of students uploading stuff from Hope College. So I'm like, great, uh, this is good, so maybe I'll write to them and write to their librarians and say, hey, this looks interesting, can, can we do an event there? The next step really is to, we're, we're trying to, we need a place to put all this data. This is just a haphazard, like spotted in the wild kind of thing. What we need is a, a national union catalog of marked copies, ultimately. Right, a place where people can contribute data that is then cross-searchable across. So we can say, show me all Emmons copies that have been marked. Show me all books about slavery that have been marked, and then find them. We're not quite there yet, but that's uh, we've got our eye on that. So we wanted to do the UVA materials first, so we'd have some statistics, a process, a sense of whether, whether it was worth the candle and what was coming out. And now I think we can go to the funders and say, look, we need to build some alliances with, say, five other libraries where we all do it together, contribute to a common data pool that's searchable. And then just a follow-up question, have, um, have y'all done anything, or uh, do you think that you would find, maybe not as many, but similar results in public libraries? Yeah, well, um, New York Public Library is definitely on our radar, so that, but that's kind of an exception that proves the, you know, that proves, keeps us in that research library environment. Public libraries, some could. The problem with public libraries is they tend to get, there's a lot of turnover in their, most of their stacks. They don't keep a lot of old books because they're there to serve the local readership community, and they don't just keep things around. You know, some libraries do. Some little communities probably have a lot of 19th century books on the shelf, but my sense is that those turn over rapidly, and also that they probably didn't build their collections via donations from, from fountains. They probably bought the books. You know what I mean? You'd have to find a very old public library that somehow, you know, accreted local collections. But I don't know. Do, I mean, does your local library accept donations? I don't think it does. It, it does. So maybe, maybe that did happen. I haven't really gone on that road because I've been trying, because I'm in the university world, I've been trying to come at it from my contacts within academia. But yeah, public libraries would be a good place. It might be a good place to find other kinds of readerships than just the wealthy families who were connected to universities and college. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to talk for a minute and talk about a question that comes out. Okay. This, this is just absolutely fascinating. I, I get the same feeling of uh, being in touch with these individuals that I got with Suzanne Barnes just talking about their book and then their letters. That there's something innately human about the things that you found that, quite frankly, I feel lacking in my own life. And I started to think 150 years from now when somebody looks at the remnants of what's left behind in my life, it's going to seem so much less human than what I'm able to touch. And, and, and see, have you thought about that? Does it, does it affect you? Have you thought about what it is? Well, you're, you know, you're, you're leaving a lot of traces. You're probably leaving more, you know, all the time. We're leaving digital traces. Our footprints are everywhere. Every time we go online, we're, we're, we're leaving cookies everywhere and foot, you know, trails and breadcrumbs and likes and, and uh, whatever. The, the Google, you know, the advertisers know. That's why they send you those ads that they think might appeal to you. Because So there's lots of traces that we're leaving, but as you say, it's completely immaterial. It's all just served as an information. And so it doesn't have the kind of the romance and the tactility of this. This is the one I always show when I think about tactility. This is those two girls tracing each other's hands in a copy of Shakespeare. It says, uh, Ruthie Whitehead's ugly hand. Oh no, I mean beautiful one. She's making fun of her friend. Making fun of her friend's hand. I think that, I think that, that, that that's, one is Ruthie Whitehead, the other is Miriam Trowbridge. They were schoolgirls at Madame Chagoury's like, Fashionable Academy in New York. And they're about 15 years old. And they're supposed to be reading Shakespeare, but they're tracing each other's hands. I'm assuming they're both right-handed, and therefore uh, that's Ruthie's hand, and then that's uh, Miriam's hand up there. I can't quite prove that, but that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a kind of interesting example. But it, it brings back that kind of spectral quality of the 19th century body, that tactility, that material trace, and you do feel like you're you're holding something in your hand that you know, that was held by their hand. It's a real connection. But, um, so, but I do think one of the reasons this project has captured the imaginations of people recently is not just a nostalgia, a romance for the past, but a sense that we are always interacting with text all the time now in these digital environments. And so when you see marginalia, you're like, oh yeah, that's like the comment I left on the YouTube video. Or you see underlining, you're like, oh yeah, that's, how, that's like that thing I liked uh, on Instagram. It's, it's a similar kind of social media interactivity that's, that we're involved with now, maybe even more so. Um, we, pr we probably, I'm sure we process, I don't know, we probably process more text daily than a 19th century person did, but, but it's all coming through our phone and our, and our email. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So there are these interesting parallels in the differences. Yeah? So at the end of the day, I came in a few minutes late, so you may have, have begun with an idea of how you determine what marginalia is meaningful. You made a comment about students writing in, in books and libraries designating that as damaged. Yeah. Um, and then this question about public libraries yep. and the idea that obviously a readership that writes in the public library books would be technically damaging someone else's property. Yep. So they give us marginalia insight into less privileged marginalia. And so how do you value original readership marginalia versus um, layers of it, right? So some of these public library books might have dozens of different voices for sure. No, and I, I think that's part of the larger world of marginalia studies that people are realizing this is interesting, you know, because of what I say, that we're interested in interactivity and social media and layers and all of that. Um, I had to put borders around this project, and because I was working with librarians, they did not want it to be about damaging library books. Right? It could not be like, the more damaged, the better. You know, which is sort of the, the argument. In a certain way, it's like, this doesn't have any marks in it, and if it does, it's valuable to doesn't, it doesn't. But they did not want that to mean that an open season of students like taking classes into right in the library books. That would not go over well. So I had to put a bright line division between these had to have been made before the book came into the library. I don't care who made them. They could have been made by a previous owner. They could have been made by a previous library that held it or whatever. But it has to be before its current institution. Otherwise, you know, it just gets too intractable. But your larger point is certainly true that um, history keeps going, and these books are continuing to have lives. Part of my larger claim is that books are not sta stable, static objects. We tend to say, oh, digital texts are ephemeral and always changing, and books are solid and stable. Books are changing all the time uh, at a slightly slower rate, um, but they are accreting evidence, and depending on, sometimes they're changing very rapidly, very quickly, and sometimes they're stable for a long time, but books are just as layered and, and complex and changeable and morphable, depending on how you look at them, as some websites. And so thinking about that book in that way, I think is really salutary. Um, I wonder um, if you've noticed any, let's go to YouTube, Michael, whether you've noticed any change in your students' relationship with their books and um, whether they might be more inclined toward marginalia and notation than they might earlier have been. I think one of the things that really frustrates me, especially um, in the world of renting textbooks that we're in now, is to walk around my class, my English class, and see books that I would consider not to have been read because the pages are clean. And I say, this book, you have not read this. Um, well, different people read different ways. So some people are very active annotators, and we need to, they tend to personality. It's a way. It's a sort of a way of thinking. Some people think with pencil and hand, and that's really what reading means: is that kind of interactive, top dotting, underlining, all yeah. that. And partly that's uh, just a. Uh, I don't know. I don't actually do it that much. I don't write that much in books. Strangely. I mean, I do for classroom purposes. If I'm trying to teach something, I want to make sure I've got it annotated. But if I'm just reading a book for pleasure, I, I, I don't read with pencil and hand. Some people do. I don't know if things are changing. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think um, students are shocked to use books in a way. They don't use them that way. And so when I, I mean, maybe a modern anthology, but if I put old books in front of them, there's a, it's a kind of technological, it's sort of like trying to use a manual typewriter. They're like, Hey, what, what do I do with this thing? It's, it's obviously still functioning, but I'm not quite sure how to navigate its informational structures, and so yeah. maybe that's what like it is. Right, right, right. Any other questions? All right, so um, I think what we'll do is probably uh, head into the stacks if you can. And we, we're going to, well, Mike, I'll let Michael describe this portion of the, of the exercise. He has maybe logistically a little better. Um, but it is, it's sort of like an archaeological dig. We were in there this morning before Michael's class, we pulled some examples of the slavery one that we found and a few others. And I couldn't drag him away. I mean, he, he was in there and he's like, no, wait, I got, there's more, there's more. Um, and there is more, there's always more. And you never know what's going to come out. And it is that has that thrill of the chase. You're never sure. It's like digging in a, you know, there's a dig spot, you know, there's a temple under there somewhere. And then a posture comes up and you're happy. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. How do you want to run this next Yeah, so, well, first of all, it's guilty as charged. I mean, this is like the closest to a minute of anthropological pleasure that I, that I get. You know, it's not really like going out to the Yucatan, you know, which is weird. I should probably do some of that. Just like that same sense of kind of looking for treasure in, in but um, 
Uh, my understanding, and really I, I should say that, that uh, Jamie Wilson and Ryer are here, and they may have some additional uh, instructions for us, but my understanding is that um, in, in just a second, we will kind of exit the back door of the auditorium here, and we can um, go directly into the library through that door that is always there, but never open, and fire alarm usually. Um, and that um, our, our goal uh, here will be to, to, to see how many 19th century books that, you know, we can find, and to see whether we can find any that have um, any book traces, you know, large or small, that might be meaningful. Um, once we found those, and I think we'll have some library staff members on hand to help kind of direct us to parts of the stacks that might be especially rich in 19th century holdings. Um, but once we found um, an example or two that we're interested to pull off the shelves um, and think more about, um, we will take them down to the Reeks Reading Room, which is on the first floor of the library, right near the circulation desk. And I um, think that if people are interested um, in the idea that we might spend you know, 20 minutes or so kind of talking informally about what we found um, and, and thinking about the, the meanings and traces that are here in the MOSAP's collection. I think there also will be some refreshments on hand um, for those of us like myself who are in need of a little, you know, early afternoon. You know, yeah. So um, that, that's what I have to say. I'm happy to kind of lead the, the, the charge up into the library. Um, but Jamie, do you have anything to add to that? Just that um, the staff will be gathered around the front desk and um, when you walk up here to your left, it's going to be on the same main level. You just walk all the way to the other side of the library. That's where the front desk is. And you'll see me, so feel free to ask me any questions about where things are. I'll be happy to help. So pre-23 is the cutoff. So it's got to be printed before book printed before 1923. I'm particularly interested in literary examples, but that's just me. Pick your subject area and see what you can find. The library is, is, has stronger pre-23 holdings in different subject areas. It was some good stuff in history, some good stuff in religion, some good stuff in literature so far. That's about all we looked at, but again, we only looked for about 20 minutes. So spend about a half an hour, it, it, however long it takes you to find a good example. Come down to the reading room and we'll talk. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everyone.